Hey everyone, how is it going? Welcome to the first official episode of Coffee with Kage, powered by, you guessed it, coffee. So, as you can probably guess by the window I have up here, my initial topic is or World of Warcraft Shadowlands. Now, I originally planned this podcast way back during BlizzCon, but it took me a while to collect my thoughts on it put something together and come up with what I want to happen in Shadowlands, what I would love to see happen, what I would love to see them depart from, and my concerns and questions on what they are planning at this stage for Shadowlands. And before I get into all that, I want to get into a little bit about what this podcast is going to be like going forward. Uh, the first thing I'm definitely going to be doing is doing gaming topics, but of course gaming isn't my only or interest here. I also like to do flight simulation, I'm into fitness and health, and just generally topics that interest me and I feel are worth sharing my opinion on. And this is what my channel is, my opinion. It is not fact, it is not media, it is just an independent individual who has an opinion and likes some things and doesn't like others, same as you. Just today's topic happens to be World of Warcraft, so let's get back to it. So, as you can see, Shadowlands. I love World of Warcraft. I love the Blizzard IP. That's not to say that Blizzard has not stumbled this past year. In fact, they have fallen right on their face. I will admit this. And some of you might call me a shill for liking Warcraft. I like the game, and I cannot like the company at the same time. Because, let's face it, I'm a human. I've been playing World of Warcraft since World of Warcraft or was back in its infancy is in Warcraft Orcs and Humans, the RTS game. And to, to, to be perfectly fair about it, you can love the game and not like what the company's doing at the same time. So that's why I'm supporting the developers and supporting the storytellers but not necessarily publicly supporting the decisions made by management because they have made some very poor ones, which is going to be its own podcast topic, in my opinion, on that. So, well, let's get into Shadowlands specifically. So, we start the expansion by Sylvanas kicking the ever-looping crap out of Bolvar. And fair warning, this podcast is not for kids, so if you're under 18, please discontinue watching at this time. And if you are over 18 and just don't approve of swearing or strong opinions, then this may not be the channel for you. So, let's get back into it. Savant's is kicking the ever-living shit out of Bolvar, which is absolutely absurd, because she should not be that strong. I think this might be a narrative point to kind of progress the story to explain why she is that strong, because it doesn't make any sense. She shouldn't have been surfing the way she did, and she definitely should not be stomping the crap out of Bolvar like she is in this cutscene. Which, I want to play this cutscene, but I'm not going to for now, because I want to make sure I'm not violating copyright. So, it's pretty apparent that at some point along the way, she made a deal with somebody who is feeding her extra power. And there's already al or allusions to this during the fight with or Saurfang that something is going on, like I said, and it just, it gets really freaking obvious with Bolvar. So, fast forward a few sec or a few seconds into the fight, or she snatches the Helm of Domination off of Bolvar, severing his ties as the Lich King, or, or very angrily proclaims life as a prison, and then just completely shatters this helm, right? Which is the one he is wearing in this scene right here. And... Yeah, to say that that excited me on the path that this is going, because it opens up a gigantic hole in the sky with something that looks like a very rough and primitive, but yet sinister mirror of Ice Crown Citadel, which is already itself pretty sinister looking. And basically, it gets us to this point where there's no more Lich King. We're looking at a very grim, shadowy place that looks very foreboding and is looming over Ice Crown, which is already a foreboding place in itself, but it looks like a paradise compared to what we're looking at. And Sylvanas is in front of this very, very ominous-looking figure that's just looming over everything with some of her Valkyr, and... That gives me the same kind of chill bumps that Gul'dan originally gave me back when he was returning as the big bad guy. 
and for the record, Horror Wars of Draenor was not my favorite expansion. In fact, it was probably my worst rated, only surpassed, or not, well, it was the worst. And I was barely beaten out by the next worst, which in my opinion was Cataclysm. I have my own reasons for that, which I will cover later. But some people are kind of concerned about this expansion, and I get the concerns. I have some myself, but I'm also excited about it because I feel like Shadowlands is moving in a new direction for the franchise, which is needed. Very much so. But what is needed? Well, now they can get away from some established or or some well-established themes and ideas and start exploring brand new content to add to the lore. Now, that's not saying that they shouldn't remember the lore and make it sequential and linear and make it a natural progression because if they forget what they've already written to write a whole new story and just disregard what happened in the past, then that is a recipe for disaster. We have seen this in the recent Star Wars films. We have seen this in Star Trek Discovery. It does not end well because that just makes your fans mad. Believe me, I am very angry as both a Star Trek and Star Wars fan. Man, that's going to be a different, different set of topics. So, the first thing, I'm not going to cover every single detail. I'm just going to cover the things that I feel are important to me as a player of the World of Warcraft. So, yeah, if you want a, like a detail for detail coverage, like every little thing that was announced at BlizzCon, the patch notes have come out in the beta, there are other channels that do that way better than I ever could. That's not my goal here. So, but... As a 25-year player veteran, I have opinions about this. So, what am I excited about? First, the level squish. Going from level 120 back to level 60, or as the max level, to me, makes sense. Now, making level 55 the new level 120, that kind of made me scratch my head, but there's a reason to the madness, I'm sure. And making level 60 the new max does make sense because now instead of level 1 through 100 basically having little to no meaning now that one level is going to be a significant jump and have with it a or increase of strength that was reminiscent of the original world of warcraft where 1 through 10 was a big jump and 1 th or 10 through 20 was a big jump and it's going to feel more like that now so that i am very excited to see my concern is how they're going to revamp talent trees to a mesh with this. They didn't really reveal that, but I feel like that's something that probably should be announced sooner rather than later so they can get feedback. I'm hoping that they go back to a pre-Wrath style talent tree to where it's more individualized, where you get the talents you want from each talent tree versus having a cookie cutter one, which is exactly what we got now. Because there is very little variation on what works well on a rate and what doesn't. So, the, the, yeah, and as a and d player, I, I feel like the levels should matter too. Because they do matter in d and a lot. And that is kind of what World of Warcraft is thematically based on and the structure of its play. So, they should have meaning... And now they're going to have meaning again, because since Warlords, they kind of lost that. And the, the new starting zone. I am really excited for this, the simple fact, I am so, so, so bored of starting a new character at level 1 and having to work, work up to level 10, even with heirlooms. It is still an excruciating process because I have done it so freaking much. It is ridiculous. And I just don't want to do it. That's why the Allied races, I'm glad you kind of bypass that and you can get started with the or or with these zones to start at level 20. Which is a good thing because you're not quite as bored at that point. But I'm even kind of bored of the lower level zones because I haven't gone through them so much even on Allied races. So... Having a new starting experience from level 1 to 10 is going to be a boon, and it's going to give a fresh new leveling experience for veteran players and be a better intro to the game for brand new players who need to understand how the game is structured. Because it gives you 1 through 10 and ends in a mini dungeon or a raid, which can still be soloable, but is also something you are more geared to be doing in a party, which is the entire point of the game. So, 
after the intro, one of the biggest complaints I've had about Warcraft up until this point is that the older expansion's content is simply lost to players that are leveling up and brand new players you get halfway through you just get more like hey i'm done with this i'm not getting where i want to be and i quit as a veteran player i'm tired of going through all the expansions and kind of getting like half ass story because i've gotten the lore master achievement before battle for azeroth and i've gotten the flying achievements for warlords legion and battle for azeroth so i have been through all the zones and completed the stories what I want to see for veteran or not veteran players is to be able to pick your expansion that you liked and to go through it and to truly get the story and get something out of it. Where as it stands right now, you're in an expansion for all ten levels, but you might get through a zone, maybe two zones if you're taking your time, and you're just done with that and you move on to the next set of zones. So you really don't get to engage and include yourself in the story. You just kind of get a part of it and you're done. For new players, now that they'll have to go through initially or Battle for Azeroth and then into Shadowlands to get the or get the kind of story that goes with that. But after that, and veteran players also will be in this category, they can pick their expansion. So if you want to level through Burning Crusade, you get through the intro, you go right into Burning Crusade. If you want to level through the Classic Zones, get done with your intro, go right into Classic Zones. And you are set up to go through that entire retire expansion from 1 to 55 and then jump into Shadowlands so it is a great experience that I think is going to happen up is it going to work out the way I hope it does that remains to be seen I want to see some of the beta content to come out before that so or flying like this is probably the biggest sticking point I have in the entirety of Warcraft right now because having to have achievements to be able to fly around these maps, let me bring this up. Uh, I don't need Warcraft 3, but uh, that'll work. Uh, Oh, really? Uh, I really don't like how Google does this sometimes, but... Uh, so, you, you get what I'm going for here. You have all these different zones, and, and Classic Warcraft, it didn't exist until Cataclysm. I'm glad they made that change. Pandaria, you could buy it at max level, which was the perfect balance because you had to level through the entire game and play through it before you could actually get it. And then you could buy tomes and give it to your alts so they could just go ahead and fly. That was the best way to do it, I think, because it was still a barrier to get flying, but it still got the war or the developer's intent to actually experience the world and the story before you started flying around it. It was the perfect balance. Then, Warlords of Draenor. I feel like that just dropped a huge bomb because the developers didn't want you to fly in it and it took so much feedback for them to eventually put it in there so they or they achievement gated it. Some things should be achievement gated. Like hold on. And, and perfect example right here. Allied races. These I do not mind being achievement gated because they actually have a purpose to their achievements. It makes sense. If you want to play as, for example, a Nightborn or a Void Elf, you have to go through the story and actually get in good with them so you have formed an alliance with them. Narratively, it is perfect. It makes sense. There is a reason to get that exalted achievement and to become an allied race with them. Even though, of course, going through the story with them, you're probably not going to get it. You have to work for it. You have to do the Earth the World quest or do all the quests in the zone to help you get there. It makes sense, though, because there is something you want at the end of it, not something you need. So... Well, and of course, allied races, they come with their own or other perks like mana sabers, slender hoofs, that, that kind of stuff. So you get more mounts to come with the races, which is brilliant. 
However, flying is not something that should be tied to this because flying is fundamental to alts. Going through it initially, I get is that you need to experience the game, experience the story, get a feel for the characters that are introduced and the races that are introduced, like Zandalari trolls or Kul Tiran humans or Void Elves, Lightforged and I. I get it. But after that, after you get done it, why? Well, they are just parts of the game right now that, as far as rep, that I literally do not care about. For perfect example, Nashatar. I don't care about the factions in Nashatar. I just don't. So why should I have to grind for many, many hours to get rep for them just to unlock flying? Like in Mechagon, Mechagon is a fun zone. But the only reason I'm grinding to get that exalted status is to unlock the Mecha Gnomes in the next in the next one. And that's the only reason I wanted exalted with them. Otherwise, I don't care about that zone as much because it's not integral to the story of what the expansion is, in my opinion. It is a side story, and I'm not invested in them. Or as far as the side story, I'm not invested in Nashatar as far as the story goes because the only thing I care about Nashatar is kicking the crap out of Queen Najera. That's the only reason I even went to Nashatar, because I don't because I want to see how that story ends. Not because I want to help or races or break out of or whatever it is that's going on with them. I just don't care about them. So why should I grind rep with races I don't care about for something I need for my alts? You see my point there, Blizzard? I hope you do. So So really please, Blizzard, reconsider that position and don't achievement gate it. Or if you do, make it a story achievement gate where you get through the core stories of the zones and then unlock it. Not getting exalted with all the races or in all the factions, including the ones that literally are not cared about. So, let's move on to the next point. Allied race or death knights. This is something that should have been included when the Pandaren or were, were introduced as an allied race, I think. And I call them allied races because they are neutral and you can pick your faction or in both sides. They kind of compete to earn their trust back in mess. So they're the first allied race, in my opinion. That's when the new Death Knights should have been introduced. I don't know why they weren't, but I'm glad they're finally doing it. And I am excited to see the Fire Death Knights because that is Bolvar's baby right there, yo. And that is going to be really fun to play, just burning everything as a Death Knight. So. I'm really excited for that. Uh, now, some concerns. With Battle for Azeroth and Legion, there was an almost endless artifact power or Azeroth power grind, both AP grinds. It's seemingly endless at this point, and you have to have a massive, ridiculous amount of Azeroth power to have the best gear you can get. Which is a separate issue, but has been covered by many others. I'm not going to get into that specifically. I'll only make a footnote on that and say that or the Azerite gear was a good idea, but very poorly executed, and it just has not worked. So please depart from that in Shadowlands. And I think the new Anima Power, ironically also an AP grind, or does have an end to it, which I think is a good thing, but I'm concerned that the implementation may end up making it another AP grind, like in Legion and BFA. Don't mind my dog yawning. But, and I really hope Blizzard takes a lesson from that and makes it have purpose and don't tie so much of the game to or AP gating like it was happened with this one because the artifact powers were kind of crappy. And the fact that you ha or had to get different gear and you couldn't re change it on the fly if you changed specs, like if you went from, say, or Restoration over to Elemental because your raid needed more DPS on the fly and you just needed all fuel a little bit. It, but you had to have two separate sets of gear for that because you couldn't change your artifact power on the fly. That is one thing that just irritates me about Battle for Azeroth. I hope Legion, not Legion, but Shadowlands does not repeat that. So, or right, and the end area, the the Tower of the Damned, 
I like the idea that it's a dungeon crawler like feel and just doesn't really have an end to it but it gives you better and better items as you progress further and further in it and it's never the same experience twice I'm concerned about how true that's going to be because I mean yes they can put RNG into it or generate different enemies but there are only so many resources to pull from within the game how long is it going to be before you start getting a generic experience almost over and over again? You just expect different things at different times instead of it being a true random generation like it needs to be. That's my concern there. It's like, like how much are they pulling from? What's the loot table going to look like? And the fact that the scales, that is going to help, but not everyone is going to want to go in there as a group and not everyone is going to want to go in there individually all the time. And if your gear is tailored to a group experience versus an individual, but you go in there as an individual and don't progress as far and don't get as good a gear, like how is that going to balance out? That's kind of a question I have, and it may have already been answered by the developers, but that's just a concern of mine right now at this point in BFA's or in and Shadowlands beginning. So, and the last thing I would like to cover is the fast leveling experience and I should have covered this back here in the level of the level squish but to me this kind of ties into the end game because once you get to a certain gear point within or World of Warcraft uh, let me get back to yeah that that's better once you get back to or get to a certain gear point you need to start working on alts and they make it a faster or leveling experience on alts, and you can get to end game a little bit easier by picking your zone because your initial playthrough is linear. Your second one is more like BFA and Legion, where you just pick your area and go. And you can pick certain in game stuff or at the beginning of your alt because you've already played through it and get going and be not as far behind on your alt as you are on your main. I don't know how well this is going to work, but I am definitely glad to see that they are making the leveling experience faster. Because, let's face it, right now playing through all the different expansions to get to endgame is a bit of a grind. And it, or Kordak's Revenge, or being the seasonal event that has helped with that, has helped a lot. Because I've gotten a lot of my ults up to max level and somewhat geared and usable in a pretty quick time frame, even the alliance side when you're losing constantly, and let's be fair, I've only, as a horde player, I've only lost a handful of games to the alliance in Korax Revenge, and it's generally because, or the horde side just screwed up and just messed up early on, and they took their own graveyards, and if you know which ones I'm talking about, awesome. If not, I suggest you play through it and watch those mid two graveyards. Or Icefall, or no, Ice Blood and Snowfall. As a Horde player, you do not want those two graveyards. Leave them alone. Just go past them, ignore them, and don't cap, don't back cap them if some, an Alliance player captures them. Just keep going. As an Alliance player, is the exact same is true for you. Ignore just one is uh, not Storm Pipe, but the next one up. Ignore that one and capture Ice Blood. That is the one you need. Ignore the one that's behind it. Just keep going. And don't even touch Snowfall. Just keep going. Trust me, you will do a lot better. But I've only lost a handful of those. And I've leveled several characters from between level 60 and 80 to 120 in a matter of days. Which for me, because I'm going to get a couple hours a day and weekends, like I'm recording this on a weekend, to do this sort of thing, that says a lot. So, with that... I'm going to get to the last point and say I'm glad that they're going back to a thematically good spot for World of Warcraft. But the one out of lore thing that I really think they need to work on is scaling back the microtransactions. It's, oh my god, those are a plague on gaming. And that will be its own or video topic a little bit later on because I need to properly write that out to, to have proper examples of blights that are microtransactions and i will say so far nintendo and netease are the two worst offenders on this and i really don't want to see or warcraft get any further into that dirty money pot and i call it dirty money for a good reason but i hope they scale those back for or for shadowlands because i don't particularly care for them now having a few mounts not a problem but level boosting why are you selling that? 
That is a manufactured problem you're selling a solution to. So fix the main problem and get rid of the sold solution. Trust me, you have enough freaking earned income off the mounts alone and the in-game pets that you do not need that kind of service. Paid transfers should not be $25 a piece. $10 a piece maybe because you're literally just telling your servers to move or X data to Y server. Not complicated. It is not that difficult. It should not cost $25. Scale that back to 10 bucks. And some of the other transactions, why are they there? I mean, just really? That, that's my opinion. Like Shadowlands is something to be excited about, but they do have some questions to answer before release, and we really need a beta like next month to make sure that good feedback is going into Blizzard's pockets so they can actually understand why they need to change this stuff and give them the proper time to do a correct fix. Not a quick fix, but a correct fix. Because if they screw this one up, then Warcraft could start going downhill again. They just started recovering from the abysmal launch of BFA and Azerite gear. So they need to listen to the player base to make sure that's good. With that, or if you got any questions, comments, or I'm welcome any feedback. This is my initial podcast, and I want to include you guys in, or, and build a community around this. Because, let's face it, we all, love, we all love coffee, and this is a gaming channel primarily. And I want to include you guys. So... Or right, eventually I would like to get back into streaming, but for now, these video podcasts are exactly where my feel my best content is going to be. So with that, I thank you for sticking around uh, all, oh God, 25 minutes, and I hope to hear from you in the comments.